we're, we're honored to, to have you uh, here. Um, we, uh, uh, we really appreciate your support. And I know a uh, number of people are gonna, gonna come a little late, they told me today. And so uh, again, I'm Dale Caldwell. We have another great program today, Sarah Crom, a CPA, the managing partner of SKC and company. Andrea Diaz, CPA, ABV, MST, um, a partner at SKC and uh, company. At some point, I'm gonna ask you what all those, uh, all those uh, letters mean. Uh, as always, I just wanna, wanna start out, uh, it'll be a little shorter than normal. Uh, who is Rothman, the FDU Rothman Institute? Well, we're at Fairleigh Dickinson University and our mission is to support, promote and research entrepreneurship with a special focus on family and veteran businesses. Um, we wouldn't exist without our wonderful uh, sponsors, the TD Bank Charitable Foundation, Provident Bank, Sun Trust, and uh, Tony Russo uh, as always joins us from CIA and J, the Commerce and Industry Association of New Jersey. Well, well, what do we do? And so we are actually in the midst now of Family Business Week. And so we created this, uh, this concept last year. And the whole idea is for people around the world to identify and support a family business. Um, our website is familybusinessweek.com. So we're encouraging you throughout the year, every day of the year, but especially this week, go out of your way, instead of going to the chain restaurants, find a family business and buy from a family business if you can you know, buy from a family business hardware and so on. So, so we really almost like shop small. We really want to, to, to really encourage, uh, encourage this. And we also created a website called Shop Family and J where you can buy gift cards for restaurants and others and spend them at a later date. It gives them the cash flow to stay, stay in existence. I also have this TV show and Tony has been on the, the TV show Family Business World which airs on rvntv.tv every Thursday at 10 a.m. and 8 p.m. And, and, and we really are promoting family businesses and the amazing things that family businesses do. Again, on our website, we have uh, some of the old shows and there's a lot of great information that these family businesses provide. Of course, we've had our Family Business Fridays, which we started in March. We took a, a little hiatus over the summer, but we expect to continue this other than holidays through the end of the year. So if there are particular topics or things of interest or organizations of interest that you'd like us to, to focus on and highlight, we're happy to, happy to do that. Um, our Veterans Launching Ventures program is better than ever. This is a eight week program where we help veterans and immediate family members of veterans develop business plans and begin to grow their businesses. Our website, veteranbusinessworld.com says, uh, we'll tell you a little more about what we do. Also, we're very proud of our, and Maura Panuski and Sue Slavin uh, have done um, incredible work on our website. So uh, uh, we have our YouTube channel and our YouTube channel is the, uh, the Rothman Institute of Entrepreneurship. And we've got 7,000 um, uh, subscribers to the channel. This, tape, this will be on that as well as some of our previous programs. So if you're looking for some business advice, it's a, it's a great free, free resource for you. And then finally, you know, this is our big week of the year. And we had our annual Family Business of the Year Awards. These were our 28th. And so on Wednesday, at noon, we identified the new family business of the year. This is a category that we created this year uh, because there were so many businesses who are under five years old and they can't compete with the hundred year old family businesses for family business of the year award. So we're gonna start to do that. And we're gonna, we're, we'll be taking recommendations or nominations throughout the year. And our award winner was Laura Mashtiller from Black Swan Espresso in Newark. The mayor shops, the mayor comes there to buy his espresso, to buy his coffee. Uh, it's an amazing place. They have amazing artwork and uh, they were just so thrilled to, uh, to, to be surprised to win this award. Our family business of the year under $10 million is uh, Dennis McCooler Jr. from McCooler Contracting. I'm gonna have Dennis on my show on, uh, on Monday. Uh, they are so committed to their employees and so committed to the community. Really, really just very, very deserving of this award. And the Family Business of the Year is someone that we know actually very, very well is the Mike Seitel from Norwalt Design. Another person has been on my TV show and, and Mike has been a regular at this. Um, they really have done an amazing shift into healthcare. They had trouble getting into healthcare before the pandemic, but now 80% of their business is in healthcare. So they're an amazing story. So, you know, again, I, 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 I wish we could, could clap for everybody, but these are, are there are all sorts of amazing businesses in New York and New Jersey. But, uh, but these were the winners. We're very proud of that. So now 
without further ado, I want to turn it over to Sarah Crom and Andrea Diaz, who have a brief presentation, but we encourage you to ask questions and I'll ask questions when they're done. So with that, I'll stop sharing. And, Thank you, Dale. And uh, I will you, start sharing if all I panelists. can. Okay, all panelists, yep. So we should be able to share now. All right. There you go. Good? Yep, perfect. Perfect. Okay, awesome. So I will kind of start this and, and then Andre and I will kick back and forth. Um, you know, just a brief overview. I am Sarah Crown, managing partner, as Dale said, of SKC and Co CPAs. We are a 25 person, three partner firm in Morris County, New Jersey. Uh, we predominantly work with entrepreneur business owners um, doing consulting. Uh, basically, we take financial structure and the numbers and the data as a foundation for the um, operational efficiencies, the management advisory services that we do. Certainly, we do a lot of tax planning and tax projections. And in the last several months, we've been doing a lot of stimulus and PPP and all types of economic consulting for our clients through this, uh, this challenging time. So we do meet with our clients at a minimum quarterly, but most of them are monthly. So it's very high touch um, and very high um, hand-holding, deep relationship type work. So uh, we've been in business for 38 years, and we are happy to be back with the FDU family today. So thank you, Dale, for having us. Um, so our presentation today is going to be a little bit about, let's see if I can get these slides to advance. There we go. Um, it's kind of, for those of you that were with the FDU program a year ago, my partner, Andrea, actually was on a panel that the, the result of was this small business recession planning checklist. And so we kind of thought we'd revisit it in light of everything that has happened this year um, and, and just sort of talk a little bit about that. So I'll turn it over to Andrea to kind of give us a walkthrough of the checklist. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, happy Friday. Thanks so much for having me. Um, so I wanted to just revisit not all items on the checklist. Um, as most of you have gone through this past year, um, I'm sure some of these have, have already been brought to your attention and, and um, may not be as pertinent at this uh, stage in the game, but there are certainly things on this checklist that I think are relevant for now and going forward, and, and they're always relevant. Um, one of the things that I definitely like to point out is, is working with your, your creditors, uh, reaching out to your creditors to negotiate best possible interest rate terms for your debt repayments. A lot of lenders right now uh, for if, if you own rental properties or your business is run out of, uh, you own the building where your business is run out of, um, as well as other debts and loans, they are working with their clients who maybe having a tough time through, uh, through this pandemic. So um, they're either you know, adding months on or, or allowing for forbearance for a few months. Uh, so we encourage you to work with your creditors um, to, it's much better of course, to work with them than to just not, not make payments. Um, work also with your vendors, um, a lot of vendors, your suppliers, to make sure that you're getting the best rates as well as terms. So if you need to push out your terms from 30 days to 60 days, uh, you know, vendors are, are more than willing to, most of them are more than willing to, to work with you, you know, through this time. Um, another big item to, to talk about is, is transition, ownership transition. So where are you in your business and, and are you at a point now where you're looking to continue or is it a, a potential opportunity for you to sell to another business or potentially even buy an, another business? Um, so that ownership transition, we wanna make sure that you're, if you're in a position where you're not uh, gonna say that you're talking about it and you're reaching out to your professionals and your attorney, your accountants and, and talking about that. Um, insurance. I'm, I'm sure a lot of folks are, are revisiting their insurance policies this year. And we'll talk a little bit about, you know, workman's comp and unemployment insurance a, a little bit later in the presentation, but just your overall business insurance, uh, as well as um, in life insurance for the owners of the company, making sure that, you know, if you have partners, that your partners have life insurance, uh, you know, in the unfortunate event that something happens, we want to make sure that, that you have the funds to, um, you know, potentially buy your, your partners out. Sarah, I don't know if you want to add a little uh, of anything into the 
Yeah, I mean, listen, this is a checklist that we use as a baseline for our clients. It's it's several really great options to really shore up your balance sheet and make sure your company is in good standing. Um, we like to look at our clients' businesses from a place of, are they solid enough to be sold the next day, right? Because you want to always be in a position where you're, you know, at maximum value and generating the revenue and the profitability. And so this is something that we always come to, to kind of start building our clients balance sheets and their financial statements to where they need to be, that if they wanted to go out on market and sell, then, you know, they were, would be in a really great position to do that. And they don't have to sort of wait for a three to five year runway to, to get to that level. And, and I think that even though, you know, in the last nine months, everybody has gone through varying degrees of uncertainty and some have some of our clients are doing exceptionally well in this time and some of our clients are doing exceptionally not so well in this time. Um, these are kind of evergreen steps that you can always be taking and looking at within your business to, to make it stronger and better. Is, is this, uh, will these slides be available if someone wants a copy of the slides? Because this is fantastic. Yeah, I'm sure that, that Karen can, can send them to you or Sue and make sure that everybody on the call gets them, absolutely. Perfect. Because as, as I look through that list, it just makes so much common sense, but people aren't thinking about that. You know, they're not really thinking about, you know, the, the buy sell agreements and, um, you know, the, the use of profits and, the, you know, so, so I, I think this is really, really helpful. And, and I encourage everyone out there, you know, to really use this checklist because it, it's, uh, I, I, I just hear so many folks, I can go through each one of these things. And, and I know somebody that, that didn't think about this and, and it's almost too late. So, and I, I mean, to reflect back on 2020, Dale, you know, we've seen clients that were in a really great position before we started the pandemic and the stay at home orders. And, and they fortunately were able to make it through and, and kind of tread water or, or survive through what has been the last nine months or so. And, and then other clients that maybe weren't on the strongest of footing to begin with really struggled significantly more. So not that anyone could have predicted what happened in 2020. And I'm sure when Andrea did this panel a year ago, she was not expecting this to be the, the test case for the, the recession checklist. But um, you know, certainly to, to be as, as sound as you can be from a financial standpoint to, to weather whatever uncertainty is gonna come. And there is always uncertainty in business as we know. And I just want to open it up also. Um, we are checking the chat. So if anybody has any questions, please feel free to, to put them in, in the chat. Um, we would like to make this as interactive as possible. Uh, so please feel free to, to ask questions when you have them. So I guess to continue the conversation on uncertainty, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about the economics of New Jersey and, and the new budget that just got passed, which is obviously many, many pages that could be much longer than this hour conversation, but for the snippet and the audience that we have here, I think um, what's probably most relevant is, is the change in the tax rates, right? And so when our governor signed this a, a few weeks ago, the tax rate increased from 8.97% to 10.75% for income ranges between 1 million and 5 million. Um, and so that's on the individual level. And that does end up being the second highest nation, uh, the second highest rate in the nation. Um, sadly, that is what they call the millionaire's tax. So that came out um, as well as a 2.5% surtax on corporations with income of more than 1 million. Uh, it was supposed to have been phased out. They extended it for another four years. And of course that ranks New Jersey then as having the highest CBT tax rate in the nation at 11.5%. So. Sadly, there's nothing in the budget that really benefits small businesses. Um, they're virtually ignored, no stimulus, no tax relief, um, no relief from an income tax standpoint or property tax standpoint. And it, you know, politics aside, just the sheer numbers, it's not very pro-business for New Jersey at all, sadly. And, and Andre and I are both Jersey girls born and raised, and, and, and we talk about this all the time, how, how disappointing it is that, um, you know, we as owners of SKC are small business ourselves, and our clients are small businesses. And it's just so sad that this is the current environment that, that we're seeing right now. 
Well, let's, 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 go, Tony, go ahead. Tony. Yeah, I'm sorry, Dale. Uh, just for a question for Sarah and Andrea, why wouldn't you advise companies? I don't know what the advantage is to be in a C corp, right? Because they're going to be subject to this tax, the corporate business tax. Why not change your classification to something else where you're not subject to this tax? What What are the advantages of being a C corp versus an S corp or an LLC? It, it seems like New Jersey now, I mean, with the sur surtax, we're at 11 and a half percent. Why wouldn't companies just reclassify or what are the advantages of uh, staying a C-Corp? So, I mean, I can speak to our client base. We see very few C-Corps. You know, I think ultimately when it comes down to it, if there's ever the intent to go public or to have a certain exit strategy, that's typically when people want to be in that C-Corp environment. Mm -hmm. um, but I could say probably of all of SPC's client, I could probably count on one hand how many C corps we have. Andrea, I don't know if you want to add to that. I agree. I think, and I think a lot of them are. Um, they've they've been C corps for some of them are you know a hundred years and and or ninety years old, and they've just never uh, changed. And and when you then make an election to go from a C corp to an S corp, there are certain tax implications implications so it may not be beneficial to the client to pay those taxes there's certain restrictions of things that you can't do for five years or you you're still paying the c-corp tax rate so it has to be planned it's not just a oh let's just become a you know an s-corp um so some of our our older um businesses you know businesses that have been around for a long time that family businesses that have been passed from generation to generation though that's where we're really seeing the c-corps or we see C-Corps where there are uh, foreign owners. Uh, so they don't want to pay, you know, taxes in the States. So with a C-Corp, if they're not earning any, you know, they don't have a wage, there's no flow through income, they don't have to file tax returns in the United mm -hmm. States. Um, and then there is the double taxation, but most entrepreneurs, I, I would say are, are small business owners. When I say small business owners, probably up to about 25 million in gross revenue. They're flow through entities now anyway. They're, they're LLCs, Texas partnerships, they're S corps, um, even some of the smaller ones where they were single member LLCs made the election to also be, be taxed as S corps. The other thing that I wanted to um, touch on for this and, and what I wanted to highlight is even though this budget was passed in September, the tax rates take effect as of January 1, 2020. So these are in effect for this, this tax year. Um, and if you are an employee or if you have employees that are over that are in the millionaire's tax rate increase, New Jersey is actually requesting that you withhold 22% for New Jersey withholding tax uh, to catch up for the rest of, for the, for the beginning part of the year. Um, so it just, so, you know, it's, it's not something that was passed in September and will take effect 1-1-2021. One, one, it's, in, it's in effect 1-1-2020. One, one, and there's a question in the chat. Um, it's, do you see the millionaires and business surtax driving businesses and people out of New Jersey? Are businesses reluctant to come to New Jersey? I'll have Sarah start with that yeah, one. Yeah, <laughs> I'd love to take that. <laughs> um, I'll try to stop before the end of the program. Um, so. <laughs> Yes, is the short answer. And the longer answer is we've seen it even before this recent change in, in the budget. Um, there have been many years um, of this administration that were not very pro-business. And we started to see that exodus, that export of businesses and knowledge and high wealth individuals, I want to say within the last five to, to eight years. And, um, you know, if, if this pandemic taught us anything, it's for the most part, people can pretty much operate remotely in most businesses to some extent. And so that's given people now the confidence that they can go to a less taxing or a more business friendly state and, and not have any negative consequences to their business. And it's, it's also brought them the awareness that they can get customers from all across the country or clients from all across the country because of the fact that we are doing things more virtually now. And so there's, there's less of a reason to be in the tri-state metro area, um, you know? And, and again, that's one of the reasons that make Andre and I so sad being born and bred in New Jersey, that this is really the reality, that, that the wealth is leaving. 
you know, our biggest export in New Jersey for a really long time has been higher education students. And so we export our knowledge and now we're exporting our, our family owned businesses and things that have been the foundation of New Jersey for, for centuries. And, and that's, that's tough. That's tough for, for us to, to swallow and to handle. I, I wanted to, to, to ask, if you have a small business, you know, there are a lot of tax breaks that you can, some, some tax advantages, I don't want to say tricks, that they need to talk to you about so that you fall below this, right? I mean, there, there, there are some opportunities to really manage um, your finances well enough so that you aren't subject to, to this. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think a lot of businesses don't understand that and don't use the right professionals. So I'll start and then Sarah, you can you know, jump in. So there are, of course, legal ways to minimize your tax, right? So if, and and it depends on the type of entity you are. So if you want to buy equipment or, you know, we have um, it for federal purposes, you can take section 179 or there is accelerated bonus depreciation. So if you're purchasing a large asset, um, you can accelerate that depreciation. But here in New Jersey, they only allow $25,000 of uh, depreciation. So if you were to buy a $100,000 or $200,000 piece of equipment, for federal purposes, you can deduct the entire, uh, you can expense it all in, in your first year, in, in the year of purchase. But for New Jersey purposes, you can only uh, deduct $25,000. So you have an availability to bring it down a, a little bit. There are, of course, with, with planning um, and certain uh, other expenses and, and tax strategies, you can try, you can bring down your tax, but if your earning, um, if your earnings or if your revenue is there and there isn't the opportunity where we see the challenge most often is in professional service companies uh, where you don't, they don't have the ability to buy, uh, you know, or they don't have, they don't need, it's not required to buy significant fixed assets. Um, their largest expense is typically their people and many other things don't, don't change. So there are certain strategies that you can put in place to, to try to, uh, retirement plans, of course, and, and there are some uh, more aggressive retirement planning, which is beyond the 401k or profit sharing, where you're able to put away you know, more money, but keep in mind for New Jersey purposes, they don't recognize the SEP or the simple. So you, it's certain types of plans in New Jer- that New Jersey recognize. So you have to, again, you know, make sure you're talking to your professionals, your uh, accountants and, and retirement experts uh, so that you're putting away in the right spaces in order to stay under the threshold for, for New Jersey. Yeah, and I think just to echo what Andrea said earlier, you know, he did sign this in September or October and it was retroactive to January 1. So now we're at two and a half-ish months that we can plan for how we're gonna to respond to that in this year, you know, and, and that makes it even more challenging just for 2020 specifically. So there is a question that came into the chat. Um, it's, are companies redoing their valuations now? And uh, I'll start with this and then Sarah, please jump in. So companies out are, we have seen uh, certain companies that are utilizing their down year, I'll call it in 2020, um, for and, and doing valuations for estate planning purposes. So if they are going to gift uh, any of their shares of their business and they want a lower valuation to take up less of their life, lifetime exclusion, uh, they're redoing their, their business valuations now. Um, or if they're looking to potentially uh, purchase another company, you know, companies are uh, preparing valuations. However, when you have a, a year or a specific event, and we'll call it, uh, you, you know, COVID, the 2020 year, and it's not going to replicate in the future, and your projections for future years will more ten, will mimic prior years to 2020. The valuation for your company, they don't just we don't just look at one year. We look at you know historical years, and we also look at your projection for future years. So. It will, 2020 will impact your valuation, but it's not going to be uh, drastic if after 2020, you anticipate bouncing back to pre-2020 levels. Um, So we do see companies that that are 
doing valuations to maybe get a slightly lower value, uh, like I said, for gifting and estate planning purposes or for purchases and sales. Um, that's where I'm seeing it, Sarah. I don't know if you have any any other. Yeah, I mean, we do have a section later on to, to hit on M and A activity, um, and I think we can kind of circle back to the valuations then. But yeah, I mean, we'll hit on this again, I think, in in a future slide. Perfect. So I will keep going. Andre, thank you for managing the chat since I am screen sharing. <laughs> it's way too much for me to handle. I have to do that too. Uh, so we also, again, with New Jersey staying on point, um, we have some uncertainty with the unemployment insurance. So um, obviously you, you've, you're well aware that that, that fund is, is heavily depleted since the pandemic. Uh, so what does that mean for business owners in the future and as far as planning? Um, will we have a, an increase in the unemployment tax base for business owners to help fill that gap and replenish the fund? Are there going to be increases in other taxes in, in New Jersey on business owners in the future to, to kind of refill the coffers? Um, you know, again, not pro-business, I recognize that, but, you know, these are the things that, that have happened and are continuing to happen that we need to be prudent and planning for as we move forward in, in our strategic plan and in our projections and, and our future as business owners in New Jersey, for sure. So hot topics and continue to be hot topics are the relief packages and the taxability of those. Um, so I'll kind of just give brief highlights of what these three are. And then Andre, you can chat about some of the, the nuances of them or if there's any specific questions that people have. Um, so PPP, uh, pay, pay, Payroll Protection Act, Paycheck Protection Program that we had starting back in April, um, two rounds of it, and they're trying to do a, a third round currently. Um, again, the, the, the part that we're at now in, with our clients is, is the forgiveness step, um, which the, the unknown that lies there really is the taxability, right? So the, the most important thing that came out was that these would not be taxed, right? So if you got $100,000, there was no tax that you had to pay on that. But then the IRS came out shortly thereafter and said, but if you spend $100,000 on payroll, we're not going to let you take that $100,000 payroll expense against your income. So there's, there's a battle there with the taxability of those expenses for PPP loans, even if they're forgiven. Um, HHS is uh, for healthcare providers. I believe they are on the third round of funding for that as well. Um, also something that's taxable. Um, the NJEDA has done a great job with their grant program. They keep getting funding from the state who has gotten funding through the CARES Act that originally came out. And they have done several grant programs um, specifically for certain industries and then in certain geographical regions. Again, also um, a taxable benefit and something that people and business owners who are, are partaking in these stimulus packages and these, these economic um, relief programs need to understand that, that you know, there's going to be tax implications most likely for at least two of the three. We're still out on the fence with PPP. So um, those are the, the hot topics. Of course, there's the individual stimulus $1,200 check that went to people um, that, again, they're trying to do a second round of uh, and certainly other little nuances. But the thing that people tend to forget is and usually is not reported in the headlines is the taxability of these things. And the NJEDA right now is in, uh, they have, I believe they were awarded $70 million. Sarah, correct me if that number is wrong. It's $70 million for this round, um, broken up for different industries, uh, specifically meant to benefit restaurants uh, and some of the harder hit industries through this, through 2020. Um, the right now in pre-registration. So I do encourage you to go on to the NJEDA website and, and look for the, that relief package and, and do your pre-registration. Um, HHS right now is also in round three of funding uh, or <laughs> the, I, I think NJEDA is also phase three and HHS is round three. So there are, um, I, I'd encourage you that if you're, uh, you know, if you have the availability to or if you fall, if you're qualified and you're eligible for HHS, uh, to also go on on their website, and uh, and we can certainly have you know ask Karen to send that out or send it to J Dale and Sue so it can be sent out the links so that you can 
uh, go on to the, those websites. Um, the other part to uh, bring up, which I was reading this morning, um, some of the, there are some changes to the partnership uh, tax return. And uh, so I was reading some of what the changes were to the return. And one of the items is there's a new line and it talks about the credits, the payroll credits that we were receiving uh, from the Family First, uh, from the CARES Act. And you, you know, if you had any of your employees that were out sick or they were caring for someone who was sick or they were out on family medical leave because of um, you know, caring for a child because the school was closed. There were a, a list of, of other reasons that they may have been out and you were eligible for a credit. Um, naturally, those, those expenses that you paid are not deductible. Mm -hmm. So we want you, you have to make sure that on your, your payroll reports that that's reported uh, correctly through, through year end. Um, so a question through the chat uh, regarding PPP funds. If a self-employed sole proprietor without employees uses PPP to replace lost revenue and the loan is forgiven, is the money considered taxable income to the person? We love and this question. We do, we do. Because it's actually a good, good one to answer. Because question. Yeah, it's a great question. So if you're a self-employed sole proprietor without employees and, and you received PPP, um, the most you could have received is $20,833 because you're limited it would only be one person, which is the, the sole owner of the business. And you were maxed out at $100,000 uh, annualized. So it was two and a half months of $100,000 salary. So if you received up to $20,833 and you as the sole owner are the only one who received money, you did not pay any expenses that were allowable, such as rent, utilities, uh, you did not use the funds for, for any of those expenses except to pay yourself then it is our current understanding, and this may change, but as of today, uh, our current understanding is that it is not taxable. Mm -hmm. The loan would be forgiven, and per the CARES Act, it is specifically not includable in gross income for tax purposes. Uh, there aren't any expenses that would, be, that would not be allowed to be deductible, so uh, for our understanding is that it is not taxable. Mm, okay. The... Uh... Good. Well, that's that's good. But as you said, it's subject to change. So, so my my, my, my sense is there's never been a, a a better time to have a tax accountant than than right now. <laughs> you know, Dale, it's a real fun time to be a tax accountant. Yeah, really, I, I'm, I'm sure it is. The um, no, but but I, you know, just to say that, Dale. I mean, we had a lot of of friends of our clients calling us during the height mm -hmm. of PPP when there was this scramble for front funds and. And everyone had this heated sense of understandable desperation. And, and it was sad to hear how, you know, somebody who had a relationship with somebody who was just a tax preparer and wasn't getting into the PPP game and couldn't advise them. And, and in some situations, they lost funding and, and got bumped out of line because the forms weren't filled out correctly. I mean, it was, it, it was gut-wrenching to hear this, these stories over and over again. And, and we heard quite a few of them from our clients' friends and, and other, you know, businesses that, that we know that aren't our clients, that they just did not have the right resources. Yeah, you, you, you get, kind of get what you pay for, unfortunately, in this, this, this day and age. Tony, I'll ask you, no, you're, you're, you're my, my guy in Washington and Trenton. So these relief packages and taxability, anything you want to say about, uh, about that that you found out recently? No, the only thing on the PPP, I've, I've talked to a lot of our bankers and accountants and I think the, the question that was asked by Ke Kevin is right on. Uh, people are wondering right now, how are they going to capture that on their income taxes or taxes next year? You know, and it all depends on, I guess, what you spent the money on. So that's one question. I also heard, and, and I forget the threshold where you're not going to be audited. Is it less than 150000 So, <laughs> So any, any PPP loan greater than $2 million is a guaranteed audit. So right now, anything under two million is sort of in the lottery, if you will. Right, and then uh, I think there was a question about the EDA program that was just announced. They're trying to do that through the small emergency grant program, so it's going to be a grant and not a loan. I think there was a question in the Q and A section there. Right, um, and yes. that's that's the component that tends to make it taxable, right? Because it's a grant, and grants are are taxable. Right. And then, um, um, I'm sorry, Sarah. And then no, the other no, thing ahead. that uh, a lot of our members are taking advantage of is county by county, some of the CARES Act money 
that was assessed to the states have now filtered down to the counties. So if you didn't receive a PPP or you didn't apply to an NGA or NJEDA, you could actually apply to your county uh, and then you're eligible for a grant um, up Correct. to $10,000. So that's, that's an added program that people should be aware of. Yeah, I'm in Middlesex County and, and they, they've had a program for small businesses. Again, it's not enough money, but it's, it's, it's certainly, certainly something. Right. The, the, uh, now, as far as, you know, restaurants and I, I, uh, we were talking earlier before the show and I was saying I was in, in New York and I had heard on the news that 91% of the restaurants in New York couldn't pay their full leases, you know, last month. I mean, this is, this is, is there any, are there any additional relief areas for restaurants or other things that people might not know about given what they're dealing with or, and there may not be, but what are your thoughts? I mean, when you talk about the, the tenant and the landlord situation, I mean, New Jersey has put that moratorium on um, evictions and, and, and really it's been, in my opinion, pro-tenant. Um, and th there are programs through the Department of Housing and Urban Development for relief to, to have some of that CARES money trickle down to help you know, if we're, if, we're if we're saying that our tenants don't have to pay for three to six months, then what are we gonna do for our landlords that have, that have mortgages and, and mortgage, monthly mortgages to pay? And, and so they're trying to trickle some of that money down to that level. I haven't heard how successful that's been, um, but again, that is not just restaurant specific. So I don't know of any restaurant specific other than the new, um, the EDA program that Andrea mentioned that does target restaurants and some of those harder hit industries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think the only, the only uh, building or I'll say landlord program that I've seen was really for residential and not retail or restaurants. So, you know, we have clients that own their own buildings that were wanted to get part of the relief program for landlords, but it was only for residential landlords and the residential landlords, it wasn't for any single family. It was for units of four or more, uh, but less than I believe 20 units in, in a building. So um, I, I haven't seen anything on the business side uh, where, where you know, restaurants or other, where they own their, their buildings are, are receiving relief. And, Besides and I, contacting I, their creditors, which hmm. we mentioned earlier with you know, going through your lender, um, a lot, many lenders have allowed for three or six months uh, of a holiday of, of pay, payment holiday. Well, the, the challenge is they're going to owe that money. So, you That's know, correct. right. So, so yeah. All right. So you don't have to pay for six months, but then you're starting in a restaurant with small margins and how are you going to make it up to pay? You know, so you, you don't go out of business now, but you go out of business a year from now because you've, you've got to pay, you know? And so one of the things, and I'm, I'm not asking you guys to, to support or, or not support, but I wrote an article in NJ Biz about what I, what I call, and I'm not a, I don't believe, you know, I, I, I think there are too many taxes and they're in the wrong places, but I was saying that maybe there's a need to have a pandemic equity tax. And the whole idea is that I've been going to ShopRite, which I love ShopRite. I go to Home Depot, I go to Lowe's. They've been open since this and, and, they, and, and the government's closed smaller businesses so those businesses, many of them, their revenues have been up. They're businesses that have done real well. And I'm saying, why not do a pandemic equity tax where that money goes not to the government, but directly to EDA to provide some of the relief for small businesses? Because there's no money. I mean, there's really no, the only way to get money. And, and, and I just believe in, in trying to help those businesses that have benefited from this, that they need to kind of help others. And so I'm not, I won't ask you to comment on that because it's, it's politics, but um, but we've got to do something, and I just don't see a way out of this. And and uh, um, Tony, I don't again. I don't know if you have any thoughts about you know how do we how do we level the playing field, or how do we help these businesses? Because it may just be putting off the inevitable. Oh, you're on, on mute still, Tony. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you and I have talked about this, Dale. I, I just think we have to just stay on our legislators in Trenton. Yeah. I mean, I had a long conversation with one assemblyman. Uh, you know, because there are look next year, everybody's up for election, right? Assembly, okay. Senate, the governor. So I know everybody's focused on this year's national election, but I think the really telltale sign will be what happens next year. And I think businesses need to leverage themselves now and say, here's what we want. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I just, uh, I just, it goes back to the advocacy, but whether or not we're going to get anything, it's really, 
it's unsure. I mean, you saw that the governor unfortunately vetoed a bill that would have uh, free, freed up about $30 million to restaurants. And if you read his veto, he basically says, look, we're still taking care of them through another source of money. But I guess the restaurant industry said, look, that could have been added money that we could have used. When you look at it, not to be critical, but if you look at the total amount of money that EDA put aside for all businesses, it really didn't help all that much. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, when they cap the awards at, at a certain number. So I just think, Dale, you and I have to just keep urging our businesses to reach out yeah. and to weigh in. Now, the only thing I wanted to go back to the unemployment insurance fund, because we had the labor commissioner on a call this week, mm -hmm. uh, and there is a bill moving through the assembly and Senate that would delay any employer increases in that tax during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So I think at least Trenton on that regard is trying to be a little bit uh, sensitive to the fact that, you know, there's going to be an unemployment insurance fund now that we're going to need to rebuild and, and, and that's going to be a battle. But I just wanted to let everybody know that there is some relief there. Yeah, it's, it's uh, and, and again, and, and Tony knows uh, Tim, Tim Sullivan, the CEO of NJ EDA and Al Titone were on our, our, our uh, Wednesday awards. And, and I think you know, to, to some extent they, they get it, they, the, there's just no money. I mean, uh, you know, they try to do some things and, um, um, and it's, it's, it, it really is a tough, tough, tough time. And I, I've often said on this program that, you know, the, the small businesses aren't making enough money to pay enough taxes. So government has money to help the small businesses. So it's a cyclical thing that, you know, how do we get out of it? And we need some, some smart people to be in a room to say, what do we have to do? Again, that's not, this isn't, isn't your area. But, but what I would like to ask you is, Okay, I'm a I'm a small business. I've been able to do, you know, my on my taxes online, all this stuff online, and, and it's been okay. How do I pick? Uh, how do I pick a, a a tax advisor, an accounting firm? What what are some of the things I need to look at to uh, to really make the decision? So I, I'll start, and then Andre can add. I look at it from two important points, right? So I always like to do business with other companies or other individuals who, whose values align with the values of our organization. Mm -hmm. And so that's typically something that I would advise you to look into, um, even beyond what might be on someone's website or a company's website and, and you know, have a conversation around what are the values of your organization and, and see if they align with, with your organization. Because I think that that's important when you talk about going beyond a relationship that's just tax prep Mm -hmm. you have to have a deep relationship and, and people's finances are very personal for them. And sometimes there's embarrassment or shame or a, a, a slew of different emotions around somebody's personal finances and that into your business. You're really letting somebody into, you know, your, your wallet and your checkbook and that's challenging for people. So it's, it's about having a good relationship. And I think that that starts with values. And, and so to kind of support that, um, the thing that I would recommend most of all is talking to your your friends, your your colleagues in other businesses, and see who they use and who they have great satisfaction with. Because um, you know you kind of want to be able to test drive the car before you buy it. Well, you want to have somebody have done a dress rehearsal with your new consultant or advisor before you know you you begin to to entertain working with them. So um, values and relationship, and then use your, your current network to, to connect you with, with who you think is going to be the best for you. Great, great advice. Andrea, did you want to add? I think that was, that those are, that's a great way. You know, my recommendation was also going to be to talk to your business owner friends or, um, you know, you want to make sure that the accountant that you pick has the competency in the area uh, that, so, you know, if your current accountant is mostly an individual 1040 type of accountant and you have, a, you know, a, a small business and it may have certain complexities to it, you want to make sure that you, the accounting firm that you choose specializes in, in what you do. Um, so, you know, we deal with mostly all, all business owners. Um, we're, pretty, we're mostly industry agnostic. Um, there are certain industries that, that aren't, you know, in our uh, wheelhouse that have certain niche. Um, and we refer those, those out, but you want to make sure that the accounting firm that you choose has the expertise uh, for your particular business. And, and, and so you, you really have to become financially bare 
financially financially naked, if you will, with your stuff. So when you go, oh, yeah. you, you shouldn't, because I think the other thing is one, a lot of people, you know, just get the basics. Okay, I gotta do my taxes. Here's, the, here's what you need for my taxes. But you really have to let everything out. You have to have, especially a family business, you've gotta have your personal, I mean, you really have to have someone that you trust that you can just put everything on the table because, because there are things that you can see that they won't know, right? And that's, you know, one of our strategies with our clients is, is every onboarding meeting is between one and a half to two hours. And that's really the, the getting to know you meeting. And that's so important because it asks so many more questions that seep beyond the financial aspect of a business. And it raises the awareness of the business owners. They always tend to not know what we need to know and what we best should know to serve them. And if we ask, and we start off by asking all of these questions that have um, very little to do actually with the numbers in the first meeting, um, it raises their awareness that, hey, this is something that's going on. I really need to tell my advisor this because the more that we know before it happens, the better. Um, as it's happening, okay. But after it happens, there's very little we can do to help at that point, um, except say, I'm sorry. And that doesn't do anybody any good. So, you know, to have that, proactive to your point being financially naked but really being naked to all of your business operations and right. and the ins and the outs of your organization is really where you're going to get the most value from your advisor absolutely and i'll even say i compare it sometimes to speaking to your doctor you know when you speak to your doctor about your health this is like you want to tell your doctor every, every pain because you want to make sure that you're covered completely this is your financial health yeah. so we want to know everything about your 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 finances and where you may not think it's important just let us know because it could turn into something that's important or at least you know it there could be um flags or, or we could just make you aware of certain things so I think it's it's very important to um, be completely forthcoming and remember everything that we hear and everything that we know is confidential we don't um, tell anybody just as, as your doctor wouldn't tell anybody or, or anybody else. We don't, your the information doesn't leave us. Excellent. Uh, excellent. No, that's, um, that's, that's really good. And, you know, so often, and this is a sensitive subject that, you know, a lot of people don't know that their financial, their chief financial officer is doing everything correctly. You know, we've seen fraud, we've seen theft, we've seen incompetence. Um, how does a business work with you to sensitively kind of verify that they're getting the right kind of financial advice? Or do you do, you do that? Or, or what, what advice do you have? And I'm sure you've seen that with companies. Um, I, you know, how, how, what do you do with that? And that's, that's more common than people think. So it's, it's not even just the fraud or the theft that you mentioned, you know, a lot of our clients in under 25 million don't really necessarily have a CFO or they have maybe one or two bookkeepers or some clerks or a part-time controller. Sometimes it's, it's usually not even a full-fledged department. And, you know, the, the thing that, that allows you to really get that partnership with your advisor is to, you know, start building that relationship early. So we work closely with whatever in-house bookkeeper or controller might be there already just to learn from them and, and understand their processes and sort of the ins and the outs on the finance side because very often the business owners don't know that they just see the final reports that may get to them so for us it's important to build that relationship on the at the outset with the wh whomever is actually doing that accounting work and then we can use our you know relationship and conversations that we have in a very um, easy way to, to sort of dig a little deeper and look at things a little different. And it's not as um, startling and they don't get as defensive as, as you may think. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. The, uh, and I, I asked that question because I watched too many of these biographies of musicians and it seems like every one of them has been ripped off their, their, their account. And I was watching the, you know, you may not even know the name fat Joe. There's one the other day with fat Joe and this guy, you know, this guy's accountant had uh, had, he'd been paying his mortgage, hadn't paid the mortgage for a year. And, and they still made him go to jail for four months, even though he didn't know and they showed he was making payments. Is that, you know, so, I mean, this is serious, serious stuff. But, um, 
Yeah, I just saw that yesterday, and it's like, wow. I mean, he didn't do it. He, he was doing the right thing, and yet he still went to went to, to to jail for a little bit. So, so this is this is serious time. And I guess I'm most concerned as I talk to our clients with this idea, as we talked about with restaurants. Said, okay, well, you've gotten forgiveness with your mortgage. You know, you're gonna have, have to you're gonna have to pay, or with your lease, you're gonna have to pay in six months or a year. Can you financially afford it? So the whole idea is to go through the spreadsheets to, you know, to do the analysis. What do you have to make to be able to afford to catch up? And you right. do that with clients, right? You do that. And that's absolutely. And that, that's a good segue into our next slide, which is really what are we seeing and what are we planning for, um, you know, into the, the rest of 2020 and then, of course, into 2021 and beyond. And, and you're right on the mark, Dale, with, you know, cash forecasting and projections and really understanding, you know, we've created a model for clients that allows us to make certain assumptions that we can tweak, you know, if sales are going to hit a certain target, if, if expenses are going to get cut, if we're going to have a shutdown again. Um, and so we can kind of play with all these different scenarios so that we can make really good decisions because quite honestly, we're not sure I'm leading towards, we should be proactive and plan for another shutdown or some level of stay at home orders in 2021. That's just my conservative approach to planning. I'm not saying I think it's going to happen, but I'd rather be prepared for it. Right. Um, and that's both on that financial aspect of doing the projections and doing the forecasting and some modeling, but it's also on a, an operational standpoint too. So just the other day at SKC, we did an after action report and an after action meeting on what it's been like to work virtually through all of this. And, and so we were virtual pretty much from March to July and, and from July through to now we're pretty hybrid. Um, so we've been sort of troubleshooting with our staff, what could make it better, what was good about it, what was bad about it. Um, when we have to do it all over again, how can we make it better and how can we tweak it? And so it's important to have these conversations now, even though we're all kind of feeling like we need to be off Zoom and, and out with people again, there's a lot of people that still don't feel that way and, and right. we still need to keep running our businesses and we're not sure what you know, January, February, March of 2021 is going to bring with that. So we want to be poised to be as successful as possible. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Um, the other thing that we're seeing, and, and Andre, I know you can talk about this, is the lending environment has drastically changed. Mm -hmm. um, probably the most in my career that I've ever noticed, even worse than the 2008 recession, um, simple line of credit renewals that were sending in eight pieces of paper in the past have become insane. And, and these are small lending institutions that have had relationships with our businesses for decades and with our firm for decades. And, and, and I, you can't blame anybody. I mean, listen, they have all these PPP loans on the book, on their books. And until the SBA goes through their process of forgiveness and pays those off, you know, that's making them nervous. They want certifications on how COVID has affected your businesses. It's, it's almost impossible to make that in most circumstances. Um, but there's just been, if the checklist before COVID was five items that you need in the folder for your line of credit renewal, it's grown tenfold since, since COVID. And, and on top of that, we have to also remember if you received um, a PPP loan that's on your balance sheet, that's considered debt until it's forgiven, if you've received an EIDL loan, that is on your balance sheet and, until it's forgiven. So your, you know, the banks are always looking at your debt to equity ratio, um, or your debt service ratio is, has been one that we've seen quite often. They, they want the debt service ratio uh, to be one and the number one. Um, and so we have to keep in mind that if, you know, if you're, trying to renew your lines of credits, then they're taking that in, into account. So you may get a reduction in the amount of availability uh, of your line of credit. And if you typically utilize that line of credit, like a lot of clients do at the beginning of the year, because they're spending down at the end of the year for to minimize taxes and then going into their line of credit very early in January and February, or if your business is seasonal and you, you rely on that line of credit during your down season, um, it, it could impact your cash flow. So we want to make sure, of course, that you, you have enough cash, uh, you have enough availability, credit availability to get through um, the, the cyclical parts of, of your business. So just may, I would highly encourage that you're speaking to your bankers 
Um, and if you have any renewals coming up, uh, or if you're intending on getting a line of credit, um, that you have, you know, all of your financials, your personal financial statements, and, and uh, they're asking for, like Sarah said, a lot more documentation this time around. Um, if you do not have a line of credit, and your business is doing well, I highly recommend that you obtain a line of credit now because uh, you, you don't know what the future holds. So you're better off being prepared. Having a line of credit in place, even though you may not need it right now, is something we always recommend. Uh, it's a, and if you have the availability to provide all that documentation and you're doing well, you, it, the, it's a good time to get that in place. One of the areas that's, that's broken, and we just have a few minutes, um, is credit reporting. Um, you know, mm. the credit reporting is, is really a mess. And, and, you know, it's certainly, I do a lot of work in urban communities. It's certainly horrible for urban communities, but now it's horrible for small businesses because I know a number of, of family businesses that are basically, they pay their bills, but they got forgiveness from their landlord. Well, that apparently is reported on their credit report. So their credit rating has gone down because they're not paying every month, even though it's been, not forgive, but it's been delayed. And so, so they can't get other loans. They were impacted of the PPP. I mean, we need to look really, and Tony, this is something we need to really, really talk about, looking at the credit reporting process, because it needs to, I never understood why, you know, if you pay, if you pay early, you don't get, you don't get special credit, you know? <laughs> and so, um, you know, it, it's, uh, you're in fact I'm discouraged from paying early, you know, and some people have to pay early because the, the you know, the, 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 the cash flow is fluctuating. So, I know this isn't your area, but when they're looking at line of credit, how much are they looking at your credit report? They are looking at, they're pulling, sure, they're pulling your credit report of every, every partner that's, you know, yours personally, you're likely, if you're a small business, you're likely personal guaranteeing that loan. So of course, anybody who's personally guaranteeing, they're, they're running your credit report, they're pulling financial, personal financial statements. Um, you know, I actually read an article this past week that certain credit scores are increasing because of all of the relief packages they are people are taking the loans and paying down uh, more revolving debt so mm -hmm. if they're taking some of the uh, these grants and the loans are paying down revolving debt and they've seen an increase in credit scores uh since the beginning of, of 2020 they don't necessarily anticipate that it will continue to stay <laughs> up um, that they down, but they, they, they think it could potentially be artificially inflated uh, because people are taking the relief and the grants that they're receiving and paying down revolving debt. Well, but the restaurants are going to, you know, if, if in fact your credit is impacted by, um, you know, by allowing, you know, land, land, uh, landlords allowing a delay in payment, then there's no restaurant that's going to have credit. There's no, not one, you know, 90% of the restaurants in New York City are going to have bad credit. And so yeah. the, the system, you know, it, it's broken and it's always been broken. And, and those in urban communities know because your income isn't necessarily, you know, a straight line. You're working at General Motors for 30 years where you can pay, you know, and so and, and when you don't pay, it's not. And so it's real interesting talking to these businesses. So any final comments were uh, either Sarah or Andrea or Tony? I mean, I would just say that, you know, the way that people are doing business has changed. And again, we started this by saying if you were on solid footing before this, you probably fared very well. But if you weren't and you are still with us as a business and, and operating, the thing that we have to do is, is push for sales because we're not going to get profitability by cutting expenses. That's right. going to drop pennies to the bottom line. It's really the the, the push for sales and, and marketing and business development and pivoting your, your service or your product. If it's not something that's, that's working in this environment, what, what is working or what will work in this environment and how can you service that need? Um, because the driving force that was, is going to get us out of this is, is spending and sales and revenue. Yep, yep. Great. Yeah, the only thing I would add, Dale, is I think there's going to be another round of stimulus coming from Washington after the election, no matter who wins. Uh, I really do think they understand that a, another pump of uh, some uh, some stimulus money is going to be needed. And the other thing that we're going to do, and I'm sure other business groups will do, is we're going to put pressure on Governor Murphy to start identifying and freeing up that $3.2 that was allocated to the state for, for CARES relief.
because a lot of that money hasn't been spent now. I think there's maybe three or 400 million out of that that has been spent. So, you know, stay tuned for that because that could really help the economy in so many ways. The, the um, um, Alta Tones is something very interesting on Wednesday that, that billions of dollars went unspent with the PPP. So at the federal, at the federal level. So, um, so, that, so there is some money to do stuff, but they haven't reallocated it. Well, 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 well Sarah, Andrea, Tony, just want to thank you so very much. The, the, this hour goes by so quickly <laughs> and you really are just wonderful. And, and uh, thank you for your, your insight. Um, I'm sure we'll have you again. So, uh, so thank, thank you all. You, Goodbye, everybody. Thanks, thanks, thanks for, for, for listening in and have a great Bye. weekend and we will see you next Friday. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. You too. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.